like during this call, uh, every slide uh, of my presentation, so you can ask any questions. So it's it's fine. It's not a monologue. It's probably um, like discussion. Okay. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Uh, let me know if you could see my screen right now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I'll start the presenting. Okay, perfect. Uh, so today I'll tell you about the Kubernetes login concepts and how to implement everything related to the login and practice. So before we start, uh, short agenda so we will go across um, some theoretical topics related to the common login practices and uh, after that we will talk about the like uh, specific organization of the login for the kubernetes itself um, and we will start from the best practices that we need to know before we start um, like implement the logging and to understand why we need the the logging itself. Uh, there are a lot of different sources, uh, like articles, tutorials, that defines its own best practices for the logging. But I summarized uh, the most common practices that um, that you need to follow. Uh, so the first thing that you need to start on it's the uh, implementation of the structured login uh, if you like develop some kind of application or microservice uh, so you own um, like um, you can control how the logs from that application or service will looks like and if you work with a developer so just don't hesitate and point them how the logs uh, must must look so uh, sometimes it could be the plain text logs but uh, the ideal way it's uh, to have the structured logs um, mostly structured as a json and we will talk about uh, why it could be in the json format um, but let's uh, remember this one as is the second thing is that you need to build meaning and context into the log message. So um, if translate this uh, best practice, uh, it means that you need to add um, like as many metadata to the log records as possible to understand what actually this log record is, from which service it comes, um, and et cetera, et cetera. So, just try to make your log records as more detailed as possible. Uh, the third point is avoid logging of non-essential or sensitive data. So sometimes happens that like the engineers decide to log everything from their system. It's not the right approach. So just log everything that you probably will be able to analyze in the future and will have a benefit from that information. So don't log everything. So this won't give you any kind of benefits and mostly it will just uh, bring some kind of headache because like um, there are a lot of things related to the logging volumes and etc. And from that side, uh, if you will log everything, so you will have problems with that. So just log most important things. And another thing is just uh, make sure that your log lines uh, doesn't contain the sensitive data. Yeah, because sometimes happens that logs contains the passwords or, for example, the credit cards and etc. So just make sure that you like analyze your logs on the collection level and erase all sensitive data. Uh, the fourth point is a capture logs from the diverse sources. So uh, it means that uh, try to collect logs um, from the like 
different kind of um, different kind of um, different kind of sources. Sometimes happens that log lines uh, are collected into the files. Uh, sometimes happens that logs are pushed from from some services. So just don't hesitate and use the uh, different different way. So don't try to standard um, standardize the way how you collect the logs because mostly this will limitate you uh, on the ways how you can collect the logs and like, you probably might lose some benefits from the logs collection. Aggregate and centralize your log data. So what it means actually, uh, some of the logging platforms allows you like do not collect like the whole logs, but make the aggregation of that logs. Yeah, for example, you might have uh, like a, 10 different log records, yeah, but almost with the same content. So the aggregation, it's a great way how, how you can like improve your logging. Yeah, so this will give you ability to decrease the total volume of the logs. And also this will give you ability like for better navigation between the log lines. And centralized your log data means that if you have uh, like a huge infrastructure with a different subsystems, uh, so just try to collect the logs from all of them in one place. Like don't try to set up a different platforms for the logging if it's not some kind of POC. Yeah, if uh, you're in, you are doing this in scope of the POC to select um, like the logging platform. So in that case, yeah, but. You know, ideally, like in a final stage, you must have just one login platform to collect everything. Index logs for querying and analytics. So it means that was like just do not collect the logs, but create some kind of indexes of the data inside of that logs. So this will speed up actually the um, speed up the ability. Uh, for manipulation with uh, like a huge amount of log lines. Yeah, and this probably, for example, you need to find something in the logs and you don't have any kind of index for that like uh, bunch of the logs. So the search could take more time than rather than if the logs will be like indexed. We will talk about the indexes actually um, today later. Configure real-time logs monitoring and alerting so uh, in case if you already have the system that collects and store your logs now uh, it's time like to get the benefits from your log lines so it means that you need to um, for example you can uh, build a dashboards based on your log lines or set up some kind kind of alerting based on on your log line so this will be very helpful for you uh, for example, for troubleshooting or for vulnerability detection, so there are a lot of different benefits about like about this point, and probably like it's uh, the topic for one more separate discussion. And the last point is optimize your log retention policy. Um, what actually it means? So every log log record has its own retention period. Uh, so retention period of the log line, it's a period how long you will store your log in your centralized storage. So just uh, like use some kind of corporate standards and discuss inside of the team how how long you need to like store the logs. But um, try to omit the cases when you, for example, need to store the logs for a couple of years because usually from the large distributed systems, the daily amount of the logs, it could be the terabytes of the data. So probably it will be very costly for your business. Just like, keep this in mind. And let's try to take a look on the definition of the centralized logging. So as I mentioned, like if you have a different services, uh, different parts of your infrastructure, so try to collect logs from all of them but just necessary logs, not everything. Yeah? But again, try to um, set up the logging for um, as many possible sources as, as you can. 
So this is the main idea of the centralized login. Yeah. And for example, how the main workflow of the centralized login looks like. So the first step is a collection of the data. So um, just to notify you. So today we will go across all that steps um, um, except the analysis because the analysis of the logs, again, is a very huge topic. Yeah, probably if we'll have opportunity to schedule one more session so I can I will be able to uh, tell you about the ways how you can analyze the logs and get the benefit yeah but for today we will just talk about the collection uh, processing indexing and visualization so the first step it's a collection so as I mentioned you probably might have a different different sources of the logs yeah log files um, the databases and etc so just the first step it's the like configuration of some kind of logging agent that will take all your logs and will send it, send it like to the next steps for that flow the second flow is the processing so why it's split it from the collection uh, sometimes happens that like for example you can process the logs uh, during like during the collection but uh, for some systems uh, when it will produce uh, like a large amount of the logs, uh, if you will uh, just add the processing in the same place, so it might cause some problems with performance of your target system. Yeah, and try to make a ded uh, dedicated way how you will process the logs. So on the logging cases that we will check on the next slides, I will show how how it could be actually implemented. The third step is the indexing. So it's what I actually, again, I, what I mentioned, like try to make the index of your log. So this will help you to optimize and speed up the operations with a large amount of logs in your storages. And the last step is a visualization. So based on the data that you will collect in the logs, and in case if it's that logs are actually structured, so in that case, you will be able to build some kind of different dashboards that will like, visualize um, some important data. For example, if it's a network networking logs uh, from some HTTP services and etc., so you can create some kind of visualization that will demonstrate the types of the requests, for example, type of the answers, uh, amount of the errors, like most common errors and, and etc. So there are a lot of different ways how you can visualize visualize the logs, but mostly it's uh, graphs and charts. And the last step it's the analysis of the logs. Um, so when you collect the logs, uh, you pay for the logs collection and logs uh, storing. So you like must get some kind of benefit from it. And during the analysis, you can like extract some valuable information from that log lines that will help you to improve, for example, like the common costs, uh, or for example, improve the performance of some services and and etc. Uh, now we will go uh, across some general general questions about the logs and. The first thing is the log format. So what actually it defines? So here is presented the four main component of the log record. And absolutely in all cases, you will have such structure. So, but we, for that, now we need to understand uh, what every component means and why we actually need it. So the timestamp of the log line, it's a line when the log uh, log record was generated. So don't miss much it with the timestamp when the logs log record was processed. So just in most of the cases, try to keep the original timestamp of the uh, log record because uh, in some distributed systems, you might have some kind of delay yeah, before the logs generation and before like log collection and log processing. So just keep this in mind. The second component, it's a severity. So try to instrument each log record with a severity level. Yeah, like 
uh, the severity level it's some kind of importance of the log line yeah and uh, in most of the cases like the severity level of the log line uh, tell about like about the log record itself what it actually could be in that log record the third component and actually it's mostly optional so you can omit it but um, as we saw from the best practices so just try to add as many metadata to your log records as possible so the metadata it's uh, some context data for your uh, log record uh, that point uh, that describes some kind of detail about log record for example if you collect the um, logs from the multiple containers in the kubernetes so the container name for example or pod name or the node name it could be the part of the metadata so and this will help you to understand for example from each node and or from which container this log line comes so this will help you to um, like navigate across the log lines and the last part is the content so mostly content could be the plain text but as we saw again from the best practices try to um, parse the log records and create the structured logs uh, try to like, create the structured logs from the beginning so just uh, push your uh, developers like to create like the login mechanism that, that will already already produce the structured logs but in some cases you might have no control on the logs format. In that case, you will be need to set up additional processing for the parsing of the log lines. And again, based on the parsing process, you will be able to uh, do the indexing, visualization, and analysis, because the plain text logs are, are not so valuable. And one more thing about the severity level. So there are a lot of ways how the severity level could be defined, but here is presented the standard way how the logs um, could be split. So uh, like on this slide, it will be presented from the low level to the high level. So the low level is a debug logs, and mostly you need to generate the debug logs um, during the development process. So if it's, for example, you are running everything on the production, try to omit generation of the debug logs. So start with the info logs, and uh, probably if it's possible, start from the warning logs on the production systems. But for the development purposes, the debug logs uh, will be very uh, valuable in scope of the troubleshooting. Yeah, so in most of the applications, you will be able to like choose the minimal severity level of the log lines that will be generated. It's the common paradigma of, of the logging. Yeah? And as I mentioned, yeah, try to uh, like disable um, invaluable type of the, of the severities uh, when you generate the logs. So it's mostly uh, all about the like log structure and um, like logs uh, theoretical knowledge. Yeah, and let's talk about like the implementation of each steps from the previously mentioned flow. So the first step is collection and we need to select the logging agent that we will use. So for the Kubernetes, uh, the main logging agents presented on this slide, it's a FluentD, FluentBit, an Xlog, and a file bit. So mostly there are a lot of different agents. Yeah, like the CloudWatch logging agents, or for example, Promptail. So, uh, but we, for now, we are just talking about the golden standards for the Kubernetes logging. And uh, from these four um, uh, logging agents, yeah, uh, the FluentD is pretty heavy solution. Uh, so it works as a processor. It's, it's a, it, it great work as a processor. However, like in the scope of the logs collection, uh, it might cause some performance issue. So try to omit usage of the FluentD, even in case that it's uh, recommended by Cloud Native Compute Foundation as a granted project that must be used in together with the Kubernetes for the logs collection. Try to omit it. Yeah, like from my experience, uh, if you have a 
like heavy logs flow, uh, the FluentD will take a lot of resources. Yeah. Uh, the NX log, it's some kind of proprietary solution that has like the community version and the enterprise version. And it mostly, um, the main problem of it that most of the valuable functions uh, that we need for the getting the logs on the Kubernetes uh, are just presented in the enterprise version. Uh, like and it doesn't work as an open source solution from box for us yeah so probably it's not a good stuff but if you have like an extra money and you can buy it it's a really great tool with uh, with a great performance uh the another uh logging agent it's a file big so actually if you are familiar with the elastic family so there are a lot of different bits agents and for the collection of the logs from the log files, we usually use the file bit. So the main problem of the file bit that it's uh, strictly hard coded to be used with the uh, elastic search. And this actually the problem. So you will be locked uh, with the decision of like your login platform. Yeah. In most of the cases you can use it in combination with the log stash but um like I'm, I'm not sure if you actually need to spend a lot of time to maintain two different tools like to have ability to use like a different uh, logging platform beside the elastic search and from that list our winner is the fluent beat so fluent beat it's pretty young project uh, so it was invented by the Treasure Data Company, um, and the main idea of the Fluent Beat uh, was taken from the Fluent D. So the Fluent Beat, it's the Fluent D, almost Fluent D, uh, that is written with the C language. So from the performance perspective, it works in a couple of times faster and consume less resources than Fluent D. And mostly the Fluent Bit, it's the great solution that is recommended to collect the logs from the Kubernetes itself. But in some cases, uh, like the Fluent Bit is used even to collect the logs from the IO devices that has like a limited amount of the resources. So probably it's um, the great way how you can how you can collect the logs. And also it supports a lot of different like, outputs. Uh, so you will be able to like, integrate it with a different family, like, different famous uh, login platform. So, and we will talk about the Fluentd itself and about the implementation of the login for the, for the Kubernetes with the Fluentd. Beside the login agent, you need to uh, select the logging platform. So the most famous is the Elastic. So it could be used like as a standalone service inside of your infrastructure, or you can use the um, cloud version. Uh, however, the main problem that, again, it has the open source version, and also it has like the enterprise version. And uh, for the huge amount of the logs, uh, you will be need to pay a lot of money yeah, to support even the self-hosted Elastic. Uh, another uh, systems like that are presented as um, service, like platform as a service, it's a new relic, data dog, and logs IO. So in that case, you won't be need to maintain anything. Yeah. So those systems have uh, the ways how you can integrate it with the different logging agents. So you just pay money for the um, like logs volume and for the retention period for your logs. And uh, one more solution that could be like installed as a um, also famous solution that could be installed uh, and the, com the community version of that solution like, covers almost all the requirements for the centralized logging system. It's a Splunk, uh, but mostly it doesn't have the, it doesn't demonstrate 
the um, such features for the logs analysis. Yeah, so it's just some kind of log storage. However, like it consumes a lot of resources. Yeah, and actually this is the problem. Yeah, so it consumes a lot of the resources, but this, just, this is just a storage and no other features. So beside that, we can select the Grafana login. So it's also pretty young project uh, that was inspired from the um, like from the Grafana cloud and Grafana, uh, Grafana organization. Uh, so it's also just the logging storage, yeah. But it has uh, like a very optimized um, structure and. Actually, it doesn't consume a lot of different resources, and also it's uh, it has its own open source version. Beside that, you can use like the cloud version, and uh, you also can use the enterprise version that contains like all the um, features for the for the logs analysis and etc. But if you will compare, for example, the Elastic and like enterprise Grafana Loki. So you will pay less for the Grafana Loki. And in our case, as we, for example, need uh, to implement the centralized login flow for free. So we will take just Grafana Loki community version. And definitely it will be enough. Uh, let's talk about the most approaches of like for the login pipelines. Yeah, so all logs, Logging pipelines uh, like must be based on the like centralized login flow that we already saw. Yeah. So and for each step, you need to select uh, some kind of specific tool. However, um, like the login pipeline also could be modified according to the like size of uh, size of your infrastructure and we will just right now we'll talk about that but before that let's talk uh, about important things how the kubernetes login works yeah so as we know the kubernetes uh, like orchestrate the different containers with some kind of underlying container runtime and each container runtime uh, has its own mechanism uh, uh, how to store the logs. So mostly like the um, Kubernetes, Kubernetes works uh, with underlying Docker or container key. And both of them uh, like use the file-based way how to store the logs. Yeah, so mostly if you use the vanilla Docker, so you can select the different logging drivers, for example, to um, stream the logs for for some system, yeah, directly. But if you are talking about the Kubernetes, so Kubernetes supports just a file-based way. So what it means? So every container that uh, will be scheduled by the Kubernetes has uh, some specific log file placed on the Kubernetes node and stream logs to that log file. Also, we have some kind of log rotate utility that um, performs the rotation of that log lines. Um, before the version 1.25, so uh, you were need to install the log rotate utility by yourself, but after 1.25, this feature is included in the kubelet and you can just enable it. So be careful with the log rotation because um, if you won't have the right log rotation mechanism, the log files will be huge and probably someday you will have the case when you won't have a free space on the devices uh, of your Kubernetes node. So just be careful with that. And how we will proceed with these logs. So we have the, we will have some kind of logging agent that we can like install on the node, but um, there is no sense with that because as we use the Kubernetes, so we can run the uh, logging agent inside of the Kubernetes and manage it with Kubernetes itself. Like, and this will give us ability 
to orchestrate the logging layer with the Kubernetes and don't have any kind of configuration management systems like Ansible or, or Puppet uh, to pre-configure the Kubernetes nodes with the logging agent. Yeah, so this is the main flow. Um, and based on this flow, um, like these log files are will be definitely generated by your um, container by your container runtime engine. Yeah. But the main thing that Kubernetes will um, just link that original log files from that uh, container runtime instance and will create specific folder, like the standardized folder um, in the file system with the links to the log files. So usually it's a var log containers. So var log containers folder contains the links to the, for example, uh, log files from the Docker. And in most of the cases, Docker stores the logs in the var lib, var lib Docker, and for each container, it has its own, own directory. So it's uh, not well structured from the perspective of the of the file system. Yeah, but Kubernetes help you to um, omit this issue. Uh, let's take a look on the specific cases of the logging uh, that are based on the, for example, size of your infrastructure and um, like your possibility and the amount of the logs. So the simplest way is the is presented here. So for example, you have a multiple nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. And for example, you have a multiple different containers. So each container will like generate the log file and uh, you also will have the logging agent, one logging agent per node. So in, in scope of the Kubernetes, for example, we can implement this with a daemon set. Yeah, we can stop daemon set to stop one pod with the logging agent per instance. So, and like, uh, this logging agent will stream the logs directly to the like your centralized logging platform that will uh, cost as a storage here. Yeah, so it, for example, it could be the Elastic here, or it could be, for example, Datadog here, or for example, it could be even CloudWatch if you prefer. And based on this, on the logs that will be placed in the storage, you will be able to create uh, a different dashboards. So this um, approach works fine for uh, small size of the infrastructure, yeah? Because in case if you have, a, for example, a multiple different clusters, multiple subsystems with a huge amount of the containers inside, so this will cause some kind of pressure on um on the login platform and for example if it's a self-hosted login platform uh, in that case uh, you will have problems uh, and for example if it's uh, the cloud-based uh, logging platform some of them uh, take additional costs for the networking traffic yeah and some of them could like throttle the amount of the logs per second that will be sent from the um, from your subsystems. So be careful with that, just for the for the small infrastructures. Uh, and also just in case if you store the logs as is. For the case B, uh, we have like the, the same structure, but between the logging agent and the our uh, target system, we have the processor. So what actually it, the processor is, it's um, uh, some kind of software, some service uh, that we will like process your log. So for example, what means by processing? It will drop some logs based on some condition, or for example, it will parse the logs, or it will, for example, mark the logs with the different labels um, and etc. And the main thing that you can uh, like have the processor component, um, not in the Kubernetes cluster, for example, but on some dedicated servers. Yeah, and you will be able to scale um, scale the uh, this component, and also like at the output of this component, you will be able to control the 
throughput of from that processor. So this will give you the ability uh, like to control the pressure on the login platform. However, like uh, this works for the for the middle infra. Yeah, and probably you won't have the ability um, to make a, a huge, um, huge. You will have the limited abilities to scale the the processor component. Yeah. So, and for that cases, we have like another approach. We have like the case C. Yeah, that mostly presented for the. Um, it, it could work for the uh, different infrastructure side, but mostly for like from the cost perspective, um, it's optimized for the for the huge infrastructures. Yeah, um, for these cases, the logging agents will uh, push the logs for some kind of queue. So the queue could be, for example, the Redis or Apache Kafka or, for example, AWS Kinesis. Or for example, Google Cloud pops up uh, and etc. And some amount, uh, some um, limited amount of the like the processor instances uh, will like, grab the data from this queue. And we'll do some kind of processing and we'll send it again to some kind of of storage. But in that in this in this case, um, it's presented as a distributed storage. Uh, why this difference is presented here is because, for example, for the small and um, like middle infrastructure side, you will be able to use like the monolithic storage. But for the um, huge infra, you will be need to use a distributed storage. Um, that, for example, in case of um, like some disaster with some some nodes in your storage so it will continue to work uh, and continue to store the logs from the processor so here you will be able to control the um, input to the processor and also throughput from the from the processor so and finally again the component uh, the dashboards and alerts uh, in, in the huge infrastructure um, will improve the like, visibility of the processes and events in in the in your ecosystem yeah but uh, again this um this approach it requires um like uh, high qualified engineers to maintain all all that components and from the perspective of the cause it also um also could cause some some kind of problems so now we need to understand what we will we need to choose from from that cases yeah from that cases we uh, need to measure yeah we need to measure how many logs probably how many logs we will collect and how many logs from from them we want to store uh, and based on this data we um, can uh, organize some kind of poc so for example we can select uh, a multiple login platforms and stream the logs for to all of them simultaneously and then just compare like what will we, which uh, platform will cover all our requirements and also which platform will be best from the perspective of the from the budget and also from the like working hours of your engineers yeah because if you will deploy everything for example by your hand so then you will need to maintain it and this will also take additional pressure on the budget uh, for example, for the case C, so SKC, it's almost like the same, like the, the most improved uh, uh, variant of the case B and case A. So I'll show how how we can actually implement like uh, implement it and uh, which 
in the tools we can select and what we will use uh, during the practical practical demo on this session. So as we already saw, the container produced the log files and push the logs to the log files. Uh, the Fluent, ad, a Fluent Bit agent uh, on each node will collect the data from that log files and will push everything, for example, to the Apache Kafka. Again, you can select uh, like any um, any kind of queue. Yeah, it could be, for example, Redis, but definitely you don't need, for example, RabbitMQ queue yeah, because uh, you don't need to worry about the order of the of the log lines. And mostly if you use Kafka, so beside the processing of the logs, yeah, you can, and if logs are mostly structured, so you can also stream the uh, data from the Kafka to some dedicated logs analysis platform, yeah, and, and like analyze logs uh, like on fly in that case. So, uh, here as a processor, we will have the FluentD. Why actually the FluentD? Because um, in comparison uh, like of the Fluent Bit and FluentD, so FluentD um, has better ability for extending. So the FluentD is written uh, with uh, Ruby. And for example, you can write your own plugins, your own filters, um, um, like your own output plugins, yeah, and uh, you won't be need to, for example, rebuild the whole system that is written with C, yeah. So in that case, like uh, to process the raw data, the FluentD will be the best way, yeah. From the perspective of the resources, um, as you can control the throughput and the um, amount of the input data. Yeah, so uh, you will have ability to uh, select how you will scale your FluentD itself. Yeah, and as a result from the FluentD, the FluentD will stream the logs to Grafana Loki, and we visual visualize all the data with the Grafana uh, Grafana itself. So it will give us ability to build the dashboards, create the alerts, um, and uh, do like the searches across all the logs. And also the main feature of the Grafana Loki that it has ability for the for the scaling. So we can scale uh, scale it like with without any limit without any limitations. So here is how the like main architecture for the huge uh, huge infrastructure will looks like. Uh, in our case, we will implement everything. Like we will implement mostly the case A, yeah, because like we will have just one node cluster, so we don't need like the streaming and we don't need the processing itself. Uh, now let's talk about the Fluentd itself. So. Uh, mostly the Fluent Bit has uh, very detailed documentation, uh, but it's not structured very well. Yeah? So I'll give you like um, the main points about uh, the configuration and control on the Fluent Fluent Bit, uh, and for you it will be like, pretty enough to like up and running. So uh, actually, I already told you about what actually it's what what is Fluent Bit itself. Uh, so the main thing from from this from here, I could say that Fluent Bit works across the different different platforms and different architectures. Um, so it's not the multi-platform tool, but it has a distribution for the different platforms and with. With the Fluent Bit, you will be able to like collect the logs from any any possible platform. How the main flow inside of the Fluent Bit looks? So we have some kind of input. So the input it could be, for example, log files, or we can get the input, for example, uh, with an, through the network, yeah, with a TCP or UDP protocol. 
we can get it through the REST API and etc. So in our case, we will use the file uh, file based approach. So uh, on the input step, we will get the raw data from our log source. The next step is a parsing. So the Fluent bit has its own uh, parsers. So for example, you can parse the JSON or you can set up your parser based on the regular expression. So most of the logging agents has a parsing that is based on the regular expression. So if you are not familiar with that, so now it's if now, now it's time yeah, to improve your knowledge with that. So uh, after like the raw logs will be uh, push to the parsers and after that logs will be structured so based on the structure so um, you will have like not just the one line log you will have a set of the fields and values yeah because log line is parsed based on the values of that fields so you will be able to filter out the logs so for example you will have the field with the severity and like you don't want to um send the logs with the debug severity on the next step so you can just filter out it and drop it so after the logs will be filtered it will be pushed to the local buffer so the fluent bit has two kinds of buffers so it has the uh, file buffer and in memory buffer uh, from the perspective of what is better to use um, so it depends on the hardware that you use. For example, if you use the nodes with the huge amount of the of the memory, so in that case, the in-memory uh, buffer will work fine for you. So in cases when you use the instances with a low amount of the memory, but with a fast uh, fast storage like SSD. So in that case, you will like the file store kind of the buffer will work fine for you. So based on the information from the buffer, like on the next steps, it could be like pushed to the stream processor or it could be pushed directly to the router. What means actually the stream processor? It's feature of the fluent bit that allows to use uh, SQL language to operate with the logs. Yeah, so in that case, the logs will be sent to the stream processor and this, this um, step is definitely optional. So you probably could not use this one. But uh, after the logs will be processed with the SQL, um, this SQL query, so logs could be for example on this step could be aggregated or it could be like filtered so you for example filter out the fields from the log line and you select just the necessary fields and this data will be pushed to the beginning of the of your login pipeline and will go across all the um, all the steps and once it will um, comes again to the buffer, the next step is the router. Yeah, so the router will match which log lines uh, must be sent to some specific output. Because for example, you might have uh, the multiple outputs and you need to understand like which log record must be sent to which output. So the router mechanism uh, give you ability to achieve that. And I'll show you how, how actually the router um, router works uh, yeah. based on the yeah. examples of the configuration. So the configuration of the Fluent Beat, it uh, has um, the four different sections. The first section, it's a service. So it has the configuration for the Fluent Beat daemon itself. The second um, section, and probably like we will have just one service section, and we can have the multiple input, filter, and output sections. So the input uh, defines the options for specific kind of the input. The filter again the same for the filter, and the output same for the output. Yeah, and uh, like 
all the data will go across uh, these three um, kind of um, input filter or output that you will define in the configuration. How the input, uh, sorry, how the service looks like. For example, we want to uh, like stop the like the minimal log level inside of the fluent bit logs itself. So don't mismatch with the uh, uh, like log level of the log records that the fluent bit will consume. So it's just for the troubleshooting of the fluent bit itself. For example, flush means um, like how often fluent bit uh, must send the data from the buffer to the output. So here is presented like a five seconds. So every five seconds, fluent bit will take all the data from the from the buffer and will send it to the to the output. The HTTP server, so it gives ability to enable the REST API model of the Fluent Bit. So from, from there, you will be able to get the health checks from the Fluent Bit. And also you will be able, for example, to get the metrics related to the Fluent Bit and look in the future, set up the monitoring of the Fluent Bit. And there are a lot of different options, so you can take all of them from the documentation. But here is just presented how the like mostly most common service section in the configuration file looks like. So here is the input, and uh, this actually the example of the input that we will use. Um, for the collection of the logs from the Kubernetes. Yeah, so uh, we will use the tail input plugin. So there are a lot of different plugins, but to collect the data from the like continuously um, modified log files, we use the tail plugin. So here we also present the alias. The alias, it's the optional field. Yeah, but if we, it's just for the future purposes. If you, for example, want to monitor uh, the fluent bit and we want to get them, get the metrics for each input that we will define in configuration file. So the alias will help us like, to define um, the difference between, between those inputs. Because for example, if you will have the three different inputs yeah, in the, uh, list of the metrics, it will be input zero, input one, input two. But if you will put if the alias for each of them, it will be, for example, input containers, input blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so just uh, keep this in mind. So uh, another item, it's a pass. So it's a pass to the uh, log, uh, log files, log file or log files. So you can use like the specific um, pass to some specific log, log file, or you can use a list of the log files separated with a comma, or you can use the wildcard um, mechanism. So here, as, as we know that all Kubernetes logs are stored in the var log containers, so we can just collect all the logs that are presented to in that directory. The parser defines how the, um, how the raw data from the log, log files must be parsed. The fluent bit has a set of the um, set of the parsers. Yeah, like, and one of them is this is a Docker because Docker writes the logs in specific format. So this parser will give us ability like uh, to structure the logs from the from the Docker itself. But it's not the like complete parsing, yeah, it will, it's a basic parsing. It will just split the logs for the timestamp, metadata, and etc. cetera. Uh, and another item here, it's the tag. So we need to tag for the, um, uh, for the routing. Yeah, so in the inputs, we have a text and in the outputs and the filters, we have a match, match option. So the tag, uh, will be applied to um, each log record. And based on that tag, the filters and output will be applied to that log, log record if the tag like is uh, matched to the pattern that is defined in the match section. And the memory buff limit, uh, it's um, the size of the um, like one time amount of the data like 
that could be processed uh, by this by this input. Yeah, so here we have a five megabytes. So it means that uh, like if the common size of the input data will be more than five megabytes, so the fluent bit will just stop consumption of the of the data. Will process the data in the uh, in the buffer. Yeah, that is limited with this value. And after that, it will proceed from the from the stop point. Yeah. So this will help us to omit the loose of, of the data and the like loose of the log uh, data. It's uh, a very dangerous uh, case. Yeah. So try to like follow all best practices to omit the cases. And try to achieve one hundred percentage uh, of the logs data collection, and don't lose anything. The filter section. So here is presented the Kubernetes filter um, that will um, like examine the Kubernetes API and get the metadata like pod name, labels, annotations. Uh, and etc. that is related to specific container. Yeah. And here, as, as you can see, we have a match section. So this filter will be applied just for the um, log records that was produced with a tag that starts from the cube dot and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. These two options uh, like tell us that we will we want to use the logging parser and logging exclude. So this will give us ability to add some kind of specific annotations to our containers and our pods uh, in our Kubernetes. For example, we will be able to add the annotation uh, with exclusion, right? Yeah, and uh, the old, all the um, logs that will be collected by FluentD but has it, that annotation, it will be excluded. The same for the parser, yeah, that if you will define the annotation uh, for the pod with specific name of the parser, so specific parser will be applied uh, to that log lines. Yeah, but definitely if we will use the centralized processing of the logs, so we can just omit this, but I just uh, put it to show the complete example. Um, also, for example, we had a case, it's case B, yeah, when we uh, stream the data from the uh, Fluent Bit to the some processor, yeah, so in our case, it's a Fluent D and Fluent Bit. So the Fluent Bit and Fluent D has uh, some protocol that is called forward. So it's a specific protocol that will give us ability to, inter, uh, to create interconnection between the Fluent Bit and fluent D, yeah, and stream the huge amount of the data directly fluent bit and to, to fluent D. So if you don't have any intermediate queue, we will use just a forward protocol. And the fluent bit has like ability to, uh, sorry, for example, here, let, let me show you how, how the forward output looks like. So we define the uh, output, yeah, that uh, match the tags. And we will send it to some specific Fluent D agent that will listen on some specific port. Yeah, and in our Fluent D, we will configure the like the input uh, like with the forward type for this specific port, and uh, like this will give ability to have the interconnection. But in case if we, for example, have like one like Fluent Bit instance and a multiple Fluent D instance. We can use the upstream mechanism. So this will give ability uh, to Fluent Bit to send the data for the multiple Fluent D instances. Yeah. Uh, or actually, Fluent Bit could be also connected to the another Fluent Bit, just in case. But in our case, we use a Fluent D for the processing. So here is presented Fluent D on this schema. So the upstream, um, so it works again, it works through this forward protocol. Yeah, but uh, the Fluent Bit will choose to which instance of the Fluent D send the data. So it has like almost 
uh, embedded uh, load balancing inside of it. Uh, so this will give us ability to connect the multiple Fluentd instances or Fluentd instances and make a log load balancing between them. So how it actually works. Um, so we will configure, again, we will configure the output, but we won't point the host and port. Yeah, we will just point it to some external configuration. In that external configuration, we will list all the nodes of our, for example, FluentD or FluentBit. So, and the FluentBit will just uh, choose one of it with a simple round robin and send the data to it. So in this case, we can achieve some kind of high availability because, for example, this if this node will fail and FluentBit won't be able to connect to it, it will send the data to the node too. Yeah. So this case is better from the perspective of the data safety. And uh, as I already mentioned, so we can like deploy the fluent bit itself to specific uh like with a kubernetes like do not install it directly on the machines but deploy it with um, kubernetes so for this case we will use the daemon set that will generate one pod uh, per node and each pod will have the host pass uh, volume uh, so the log files from the node machine will be directly mounted to the to the pod itself and the fluent bit in that pod will be able to access those files and collect the logs from that files however beside um beside it it will be need the service account with a um, specific role because the fluent bit with the fluent with a kubernetes filter uh, we'll examine the cube API to get the metadata. So it will be need to authorize with the cube API. So in that case, it will be need the service account with uh, permissions for the for the pods. Uh, the configuration for uh, Fluent Bit that we uh, that we will create, we will put to the config map. Like to do not build the specific um, like specific image with the with our configuration we'll just mount it with the config map and also like to set up the monitoring we will expose the um, metrics endpoint of the fluent bit with uh, kubernetes service so there we will be able to set up the prometheus collect the metrics and for example visualize it with the grafana itself so here actually is presented the default dashboard uh, so this is a free dashboard uh, that you can, for example, if you have the Prometheus and you like connected that Prometheus to your Fluent Bit, uh, and you visualize the data with the Grafana, so you can just add this dashboard and monitor like all your um, Fluent Bit or Fluent D instances. So just uh, just keep this in mind. So this is pretty useful stuff because this will give you ability to monitor how many resources uh, consumed by your fluent bit and to understand like how you can like optimize or how you can scale like deployment of your fluent bit. Uh, and also I think ah, beside like this monitoring, is just just for case the fluent bit and fluent d um are able to be connected to some enterprise service that is called calyptia so uh, this will give ability to like monitor it with the calyptia but in case if you just want to use the open source that is like also works fine so because with calyptia it's some kind of sugar uh but it's not the necessary tool and you definitely can monitor everything with the prometheus and grafana but if you just want to try go ahead uh and let's talk about the login platform so the login platform in our case it's uh Loki. so we will talk about the um, most uh common features of the Loki and how we can deploy Loki with uh, support of the high availability. Uh, so as I already mentioned that 
like Loki, it's the uh, like logs aggregation system, yeah, uh, that are provisioned by the Grafana. Uh, so, and it will give the ability like to collect the logs and make the indexing for these logs. The main problem of the Loki for this case that, as mentioned here, it indexed the um, labels for the logs, but it doesn't index the content content of the logs. So uh, this is it, this has some advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of um, of this uh, condition that um, you actually. Uh, will spend less time for the indexing process and uh, the size of the indexes will be smaller yeah um, and also this will um, we need from you like better understanding what you want to like put to the labels to be indexed uh, and what you want to omit uh, and uh, like the main disadvantage is that you need to configure the indexing by default because, for example, if you uh, use the elastic search, so all the data will be indexed, and you will just you can go across all that index data. So you need to decide what 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 you want to do, like play with the indexes or just um, use some system that has already uh, configured uh, indexes. Uh, and uh, like to um, demonstrate how it looks like so here how the logs are stored inside of the Loki. yeah so we have a timestamp we have a set of the labels and we have a content of the logs so the timestamp and the labels will be indexed the content is unindexed we can put uh, any kind of labels so the key uh, the labels uh, are presented as a key value pairs and for, for example, we want to uh, like put, for example, cluster name, yeah, because for example, if you have a multiple clusters that uh, produce the logs, so we can put the cluster label. Yeah, and for example, we have the multiple containers, we will put the container name as a label. So in that case, like we will be able to search uh, with the, with, do the fast search uh for the logs for the specific cluster and uh like search for the logs for the specific container but for the rest of the things uh we will be need to spend more time so this is a uh, like pretty deep topic uh and mostly this topic is for the uh if if you will like work with um like uh, full text search engines like Elasticsearch, uh, if you will work with that, so you will be need to deep dive in that, with that. But for our purposes, as we just want to set up the basic logging, so this understanding of the indexing click will be totally enough. Uh, how they actually uh, Loki work? So Loki could work as um, like as a single binary. Or Loki could work as a set of the distributed services. Yeah, and we have some services um, that give us ability to uh, like write the logs to the system, and some services that will give us ability to read the logs from the system, make some kind of queries, and etc. So in this case, <clears throat> like a distributor and ingestor services uh like we'll send the logs um log logs and logs chunks uh to the storage and the querier and query front end will give us ability uh like to read the logs from the storage also the logic could be supported with, with some kind of cache mechanism so usually it, it's a mem cache but it supports a different backend for the uh, for the cache. Uh, and for example, if we are doing some kind of um, like read requests uh, and look up for some kind of the data, so it like those requests, those queries will be cached 
and like the next time when we will like request the same data uh, we will have like that data for the like last time so it's actually um, how the like, common structure of the log logi looks like so again it could be the single binary like without the microservices or it could be splitted by microservices and based on this approach we could have the uh, like the monolithic mode of the deployment for example when we have the one instance and all the services related to the um, to the loki on, on the one instance and we will be able to perform write and read operations to that instance and we can scale those instances like one by one yeah so this like works fine but the main problem is for example if we have like um, um, bigger pressure for the write operations and less pressure for the read operations so this won't give us ability for example increase the amount of the like, services related for the write operations and services related to the read operations uh, it's not so flexible way but um, in case if you uh, like just want to try the Loki locally it will work fine but for the production purposes uh, it won't be so good Another way how you can do that, it's like split the instances for the write and read instances. So the write instances will be um, uh, give you ability and then points to perform the write operations. And the read instances with the read services will give you ability to perform the read operations. So this approach is better because uh, for example, you if you write more data and like, do less read operations so you'll be able to scale just the right instances like more right instances yeah uh, for example three right uh, instances and just two um read instances one more important thing that in that mode uh, the minimal amount of the instances is two so for example you cannot uh, schedule like three right instances and just one read instance so minimal amount is two uh, two and and more and the last way how you can split everything uh, it's splitting by the microservices so you can uh, deploy each service separately um, and mm, scale each service separately but this is like um, just for some edge cases where you really know what you are doing yeah, because it requires from you like deep knowledge of each service operation from the Loki. So most of the cases, like this approach will work fine. And we will try to implement this approach today. Okay. Uh, how we actually can uh, configure the Fluent Bit with Loki itself. So the Fluent Bit has the um, embedded plugin for the Loki. So here, what we will be need to do, it's uh, just put the host to the Loki, the standard port, it's a 3100. Uh, there, then we will be need to put the user and password. One more important thing that uh, the Loki itself um, doesn't have any kind of uh, authentication and authorization, authorization layers. And you will be need to define some kind of mechanism uh, that will uh, implement the basic authorization. But if you will deploy it to the Kubernetes with the Helm chart, so it has the gateway uh, gateway deployment uh, that will deploy the Nginx, and this will um, perform the like the basic authorization. So in our case, we will use the authorization. So here you will put the credentials for, for, for that authorization. Uh, another thing, it's a tenant ID. Uh, so as you remember from the from the Grafana itself, so Grafana could have the multiple organizations. The same for the Loki. Yeah, for example, you might have like the one Loki class, cluster. Yeah, but you might collect the data for the multiple organizations 
um, with a different tenant ID, yeah? And those logs will be splitted. Yeah, for example, you have a different departments uh, in your organization and you want to split all the logs to, to separate to the separate bucket and you will be able to use the tenant ID. So here is presented the static tenant ID. However, it has the option like tenant ID key. So for the ability to set the tenant ID dynamically. So you might have the multi-tenant in, in, in one cluster. Uh, and the last option, it's the auto Kubernetes label. So if you don't want to like set a list of the labels that will be pushed to the, uh, to the log itself, so you, can, you can just set this one. So all the labels uh, for your containers will be collected and configured as the labels for that specific log lines in the Loki, and then it will be indexed and etc. So this is the good approach. Uh, it's like this is the great feature. Uh, if you just want to, for example, manage the labels directly from the um, from the definition in your Kubernetes manifest. But uh, use this one just in case if you um, like know what you are doing. Yeah, we will use this as uh, in the scope of the demo, and uh, I'll show you like why it's a bad approach. If if you don't know the uh, uh, real uh, set of the labels on on the containers that he will collect the logs uh, from. Uh, this will will bring you to the bad result, and I'll demonstrate why why it works in such way. But for the like lazy testing, this this will work fine. Uh, uh, and actually, how uh, the logs will be visualized in the in the Grafana, and how you will be able to um, like query those logs. So you will be able to select the logs by the labels. And after that, you will be able to add um, some specific uh, like parsing mechanism and look up um, uh, for some specific fields. I also demonstrated how, how it actually works. And also, if you will have the structured logs, yeah, for example, like, like here, yeah, you will be able to create the aggregation. Yeah, for example, each log line contains the response code uh, from the HTTP server. So here, for example, as a detail, you will have the detailed demonstration, like how many occurrences of uh, like each uh, response code you will have. Yeah, like an example, but mostly to understand what you want to look up in the logs, you need to work with logs uh, like, uh, all the time. So it's how you can visualize, but it's just, it demonstrates how you can like visualize logs um, from the perspective of the search. Yeah, but uh, here is not presented the dashboards that you can build based on the, uh, on the log data. And also, as I mentioned, uh, there is such thing that is called Grafana Cloud. So if you don't want to like maintain the uh, log itself, you can um, like Loki and Grafana. So you can just uh, set up the free account uh, in the Grafana cloud. So this will give you like the 50 gigabyte of the um, logs, logs data forever. So if you are doing like for your like fun projects, don't spend the time and don't configure everything. Uh, just get the Grafana cloud set up the fluent bit to push the logs directly to the Grafana, Grafana cloud. And this will uh, save your time. And now it's time for the implementation. But before we will go to the practical demo, maybe somebody um, have any, any kind of questions and we, that we can discuss. Yeah. Hi everyone, I have one uh, regarding a long-term storage of logs with Loki. Have you uh, looked for this question? Uh, for, for, for example, if you have a, a big amount of logs and you should store these logs, uh, I don't know, a year, 
by uh, requirements from the customer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what actually is the question? Maybe I, I lost the first part. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I'm asking about the uh, possibility of uh, long term storage of logs with Loki when you know, uh, for example, if you will have a lot of logs for the year, for example, you will be not able to store this log just inside the instance, just inside on, of your volumes. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, do you know any kind of long term solutions for this uh -huh. okay. I particular got you. case? I got you. So Mm, like to answer for this question, I'll just show you some kind of um, some kind of block. Um, Loki storage. So the Loki um, supports different kind of like storage backends. So by default, you can use the the file system. Yeah, so you can store the logs on the, for example, instance that is running the Loki. But also you can use like uh, some like unlimited storages like S3, yeah. So for our today demo, like we will use not just the file system, we will use the like the S3, but as I don't have the S3, I will just set up the mini, mini IO uh, in my Kubernetes cluster. So, and it will just mimic the S3 support. So, uh, or for example, you can use like the DynamoDB or Google Store, uh, Cloud Storage. So this will give you like ability to omit like the limitation of the storage. And inside of the Loki, you will be able to set up some like and configure the retention policy of that logs. So mm -hmm. it's a reason why it's important to, for example, split the logs for like by labels. Because for example, using of using that labels, you will be able to configure retention policy. Or for example, if you have the like splitting by the tenancy, you will be able to configure the um, retention policy for specific tenant. Okay. And okay. Yeah. one more one more important thing, like if you will use like the monolithic mode. In that case, the file system will work fine for you. But if you want to use like the simple scalable mode or microservices mode, the file system won't work for you. You will be need to use any kind of backend like inside of the cloud or for, for example, configure the mini, uh, mini IO. Because in my case, I want to deploy uh, like the simple, um, simple scalable deployment. So I will be need some kind of uh, storage beside the file system. Make sense? Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, your tags you were mentioning about, uh, regarding configuration. Uh, you use cube.glob.asterix. I didn't quite get how it works. So it's some sort of indexing or uh, here, this globe yeah. means dot one, dot two, dot three, or it's built up something, some another way. Uh, here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, okay. So in the fluent bit and also in the fluent D. So mostly the fluent bit and fluent D has have, have the same paradigma of the configuration. So for the fluent bit, you can use some kind of uh, static tag. Yeah. For example, you can just write cube. And, and that's all, yeah? So just use the cube. But if you will use like dot point zero as a tag inside of the input, so the fluent bit and also the fluent D will take the paths to the log file, will split, like remove the slashes with dots and will just like append it instead of the wildcard symbol. So uh, here, uh, okay, got it, got it. Yeah, so here we will have, for example, cube dot var dot log dot containers dot and etc. 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 Um, so definitely you can use the cube, yeah, just cube. And like uh, this much section you can use like cube dot star. So star means zero or more sections, yeah. So for example, it will match the cube and it will also match cube dot var. And it also match cube dot var dot log and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Yeah, yeah. I just didn't quite get this uh, appending structure you just explained. Thank you. Yeah, that's all right. So why we actually do that in such way? Because, for example, if you want to configure some specific behavior, for example, some specific filter or some specific container, yeah, in that case, like you will be like apply the filters for the specific tags, but in the tag in the tag you will have the name of the container. So in that case, like you will be able to um, apply some filters to the specific containers. Make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, I have a question about how good is the idea to enforce JSON log format uh, among the developers. So let's say I don't want to deal with uh, parsing. I just want to enforce it and uh, parse it in Elasticsearch by Elasticsearch means. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, so it depends like um, on the cases that you have. Yeah. Uh, so from my side, yeah, if I have the control uh, on the log format, yeah, so I can, for example, discuss this with the developers and offer them like to send the data in some specific way. Yeah, so I will ask them to do that. For example, I have, I don't know, Node.js services. So the Node.js uh, has a lot of different um, logging frameworks that allows to send the logs in the, for example, JSON format, yeah? So if this possible, I'll force them to do that because this will give me the possibility to omit the processor usage. I don't need to do the parsing. But sometimes happens that you don't have the control, uh, like you use some kind of third party software and you cannot control the format of the login. In that case, you will be need to use the processor. So it depends on your possibilities. But definitely, like if you use the centralized logging system, it's easier to produce logs in the JSON format and collect it in the JSON format rather than parse it then. So this will save your time. It's a one point. Another point that from the perspective of the developer that they will say that the JSON logs, it's hard to read uh, like when we use, um, it's hard to read when like we use, like we are doing like development locally. Uh, in most of the cases, it's possible to like have one, um, like log format for the development uh, mode of the service or and for the production mode of the service. So the login frameworks for all programming languages and all web frameworks are pretty flexible. But for the production purposes, so I'm, I'm not sure that the developers will have the access to the production environment to get inside of like, I don't know, to connect to the production Kubernetes to check the logs in the plain text, yeah? It's one more reason why you must have the centralized logging system because this will give you ability to provide access specifically to the logs and not to the like your target system. So, but to summarize, if you have the ability like to uh, force the developers to write the logs in a JSON format, try to do that. Make sense? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is your experience about the performance, uh, for example, Loki versus Elasticsearch? Uh, um, do you have this kind of comparison? And did, did you have a chance that you had such a big volume of the logs that, I don't know, Loki? wasn't performing well or uh, the opposite? It was Elasticsearch, for example, who was uh, lacking the performance. Uh, so the main thing that um, I had such case for one of the customer, they, they used like um, Loki and they had the chance to like migrate on some SaaS platform based on the Elasticsearch. 
from the perspective of the management of the elastic source so elastic source is pretty complicated tool yeah uh, and uh, you must have like a huge experience with that platform to like bake it to deploy it and to configure everything properly so the lock in that case it's pretty simple tool from the perspective of the comparison from what I saw from the metrics, uh, from the Loki and from the um, Elastic Search. So the Elastic Search, as it's written with Java, in most of the cases consumes like a lot of the um, memory inside of the instance. And in most of the cases, you will be need to have like a dedicated instances, or if you run it inside of the Kubernetes, you will need to have a dedicated nodes for the elastic search. Because I had a problem sometimes that when the elastic instance is running with some uh, like other application on the same node, so it just stuck and, and that's all. And it's hard to detect that it's stuck. From the perspective of the performance, Loki is better because Loki could work like, uh, simultaneously with other services on the same node. And uh, as the elastic source is, like, if you are talking about the um, like um, infra, yeah. So here, yeah, like the uh, elastic works like as a monolithic, yeah. So uh, each instance of the elastic search is pretty huge instance so it consumes all the memory almost on the instance in case of the loki you can easily scale up uh, every service so this will save the resources yeah because in case of the elastic it's, it's hard to um, hard to do that so from the scope of, of that poc that i mentioned uh, so they decided to stay with loki uh, in terms of querying the logs? Mm -hmm. In terms of querying the logs, it depends on your purposes. No, it's um, from the perspective of the like logs consumption. Yeah, from the perspective of the logs querying, uh, we need to understand yeah, that Loki, it's pretty, it has pretty limited abilities for that. Yeah, so it just have uh, some kind of primitive indexing, yeah? beside the like rather than elastic search that is the full text uh, full text engine yeah so from the perspective of the indexing and querying so the elastic search probably will have like better performance but again it will consume more resources okay thanks Um, any other questions? Okay, thank you all for the questions. And let's go to the practical part. Uh, so we will implement uh, like our like our case case A. Yeah. So we will set up like the fluent bit on each instance. We will have some kind of um, storage, uh, actually Loki, and we will have some kind of dashboards that will be provisioned to visit Grafana. Uh, the main idea that um, like the Fluent Beat, Grafana and Loki has its own help charts. So we can easily like do not implement, for example, um, like this structure, yeah, write a lot of uh, manuals, and we can just use the fluent fluent bit official Helm chart. So the um, fluent bit Helm chart is presented inside of the GitHub, and you can use this GitHub repo uh, as a uh, as a Helm repo. Yeah, and it has the fluent bit, um, fluent bit charts. So you can just take a look on the values that is presented in this chart and understand how to configure it. So I already did it for you. So the same stuff for the um, 
uh, for the Loki. Uh, so I need to take a look on the GitHub here. Um, I think it's presented here. Yeah, so Grafana Helm charts. So we have a Helm chart from the for the Grafana for this repo. So just a second, Helm chart. So you can add this um, GitHub repo as a Helm chart repo. So it has a Grafana, but for the Loki stuff, uh, it will be still taken from this repo, but the main code for this chart is moved to another repo. So if you will be need to take a look on the um, on the on the source code of this chart, just go across that um, across that um, repo. Another thing that if you will be need to understand, get the documentation about the uh, Helm chart. So just uh, go to the official documentation for the Grafana Loki and check out the reference for each values for the Helm chart. Okay, so as we have, like in our case, we have three Helm chart that we want to install. So definitely we can install it like one by one, but as a, um, like some bonus for you, like for, for in the scope of this usage section, I'll show you some kind of very, very useful tool that is called Helm file. So the Helm file, it's um, some kind of uh, like tool that allow you like to configure and install and install like um, multiple multiple Helm charts. Yeah. Uh, so it's moved to another repo. So just uh, keep this in mind. So you will be able to write just one specific um one specific um helm file.yaml document and define the like all the charts that you want to install and link those charts between each other so in our case if you want to implement um this case a so we need to install the loki first and after that we need to install the fluent beat and grafana so fluent beat and grafana could be installed like simultaneously but the Loki must be installed first. And also we use the two, two different repos that we need to add, like to do not add it manually, like we can define everything in the Helm file. Uh, and also, for example, if you need to configure the centralized login, like separately for different environments, or for example, different customers, we can split everything um, with, um, like with environment documents. So let me show you how, how it actually looks like. So we have the Helm file. So the first section of this file, so actually this could be split to the multiple files and combine it to the one again. But I'll show you just one complete file like to do not jump between the files. So the Helm defaults define like the global parameters for the Helm executable uh, when the Helm chart will be installed. Here, for example, we disable the cleanup on fail, the option of the Helm that allows to make automatic cleanup. So here we will disable the uh, verification of the um, uh, Helm charts because as we use the um, repos from the GitHub, so it doesn't have the provenance files for the verification. Uh, also, we provided the um, weight option, so each release will be weighted. Yeah, for example, if you deploy the Loki, so it will be weighted until the um, Loki will be fully deployed and healthy, and after that it will deploy the Fluent Beat and Grafana. Again, wait for the jobs. Yeah, if you are talking about the Loki Helm chart, it has some specific uh, jobs for the provisioning. Yeah, so we also need to wait for the jobs. So we uh, increase the standard timeout, and uh, as we want to uh, like deploy everything to specific namespace, so it's better, like ideally, it's better to have all components of your centralized login system in specific namespace. So when installed there, everything related to the log logging, and uh, don't install there anything else. 
here we also present a couple of the environments. So we have a default environment. So uh, if we want to pass the environment option, it will use the default. And here also presented, for example, the production stuff. We want to push some kind of uh, like security credential data. So we will be need to configure the credentials for the Grafana. We will be need to configure the username password for the Loki pass it to the fluent bit itself. So to make this, we will use the mm, this secret option, yeah? So we have uh, environment folder for which environment we will have a specific folder. And there we will have the secret, secret file. Uh, so let me uh, show you just, just, just to, uh, just to, sorry, okay. Um, just to show you. So the original secret file um, will looks like this. So we have the uh, username, password, peer, pairs for the Loki and for the Grafana. And we want like, to reuse it and pass it to our Helm charts. Uh, but to share it um, like safely, we want to make a decryption. So we have some kind of Helm secrets um, plugin that will give us ability to uh, encrypt the file with the sensitive data. So in our case, we use the encrypt um, like for this file and we will encrypt it with a uh, GPG. Yeah, because like on my local machine, I have a GPG key that I use, for example, for the code signing uh, and et cetera and for the encryption. But for example, you can use the KMS keys from the cloud and etc. So to use the uh, like Helm secrets, so you will be need to install the Helm secrets plugin. And also you will be need to put uh, this .sobs.yaml file to the root of your project. And here just write that you want to allow the encryption for file or, uh, with the specific pass and use the specific, for example, PGP key. Or here I can, for example, write the key MS and put the IRN of the key MS key in my AWS account and a set of the parameter uh, like with the access to that key, key MS key, like an example. Yeah, so, and after that, like this will be encrypted. Yeah, so I will just make, so I'll put all the comments to the make file. Uh, let me show you. Yeah, so I have the Helm secrets encrypt uh, for this file and decrypt uh, again. So I'll just make the decrypt. Okay, and here I can see that my log, like my file with them, uh, with this data is encrypted. Also, it's very useful that you can like use uh, uh, this um, approach with the secrets. You can, for example, use the HashiCorp vault and refer to the vault uh, directly to the vault and reuse it in your uh, in, in your template. So in our case, we just want to put uh, like some portion of the credentials to our deployments. So we set up two kind of repositories that we will like reuse. So we won't be need to like edit manually. The Helm file will uh, install it automatically. Also, we will put the common labels. Don't mismatch this with the labels on the pods or the deployment. So uh, this label is like the internal feature, yeah? Uh, for example, if you have the multiple Helm charts, you can add the specific label to each, uh, each release of your Helm chart as defined here, yeah? And uh, you will be able like to, for example, make, deploy not the, all the services, but the service with specific label. Yeah, so this is like a very important stuff. And the common label, it's uh, like allows you, um, like if you use a multiple help file, uh, files, this will give you ability uh, like to use a specific, uh, uh, like specific labels for the whole file. So in our case, we need to uh, like deploy uh, 
FluentBit, Loki, and Grafana. So here is a um, definition of the Helm chart for the FluentBit. So I named this release as a FluentBit. So I used this uh, placeholder. Yeah, like, like we, so everything like we do in the Helm charts templates works here also. Uh, if we, I will take a look on this uh, file. So I put the environment, I will also put the namespace parameters here. So the namespace that I will use, like I will use the cube logging, it will be passed through the namespace key and I can use this placeholder like to take the information from the outside, like from the uh, console key and put it here. Uh, I will use specific chart for the fluent bit, specific version, and here I can define the like values that I will be need for the uh, for that Helm chart. So I will override the like name for this. I will use the um, Docker Hub instead of the custom registry. I will disable the test framework because I don't need to use the Helm testing. And also I will just change the parameter, uh, like the input and uh, filters in that Helm chart uh, is already configured to collect the logs for the Kubernetes. So in my case, I just need to like override the output. So what I'm doing here, I'm just setting up the Loki um, output. I take the um, like, information for the username and password from uh, from my secret file yeah but it's it's encrypted during the deployment it will be unencrypted temporarily unencrypted the data will be passed to the template and everything will work fine and also i passed that this release needs release of another release like release of the loki and here i define it everything for the loki so I enabled the support of the Mineo. So uh, if you just want to like make a local test, so the Helm chart supports the installation of the Mini IO. So just do not install it separately, use it, and it's fully integrated in this Helm chart. Again, I disabled the tests, uh, used uh, like uh, the custom ports uh, for the gateway. So the gateway in this Helm chart, it's um, like the Nginx container that will load balance uh, the requests uh, based on the um, like the path of that request to the read replicas and to the write replicas. So and also it uh, gives me ability to set up the basic authorization. So what I actually completed here, I configure it to use like two read replicas and two bright replicas. And here is, uh, I just disabled unnecessary feature to speed up the deployment, but um, it's not so crucial to explain. The same for the Grafana. So um, I took just not the Grafana, but I took the Grafana OSS, uh, like to speed up the Grafana deployment and also like omit some errors that uh, is related to the, um, enterprise image, uh, passed the credentials to the Grafana, added some kind of Grafana any uh, parameters. And also I added the data source here. So uh, I just configured the Loki, set that uh, the address to the Loki and configured that it used the basic authorization through the gateway. One more important thing, as I use the, um, like here you can see that I use the tenant ID, so I use the multi-tenancy mode, so I will be need to set up one data source per tenant and to point the Grafana that I want to use the specific tenant, I will be need to pass the specific header to the during the connection to the Loki. So it's called Xscope org ID. So by default, when you use the auto provisioning for the Grafana, so the name of the header is put to the JSON da data and the uh, header value is pushed to the secure JSON data. So here I use the mini 
and also here I will push all the data to the mini queue. So the tenant ID is not strict value. You can put any um, alphanumeric value here. So and like uh, the like splitting between the tenant is um, uh, is pretty dynamic. So you can define as many tenant as you want, and the tenant will be defined. Uh, as soon as you will put at least one log line with that tenant ID. Uh, okay, and the Grafana also, I put that it need, 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 needs locking. So in my case, what I just need to do, I need to encrypt the um, secrets what I did. So here I have the two variables that I can override if needed. But in my case, I just uh, need to do the um, like Helm file apply and apply all my changes. Uh, just to demonstrate what we will have, I'll just open the I'll just open the dashboard here. Okay. And we'll do make boy. Okay, I need to enter the password for my GPG key to decrypt the secrets. So as you can see here, it generated um, it generated all the resources here so I can see what actually changed it. So it also used the Helm difference. So it allows you to make, for example, if you change something, just one line, so it will uh, be able to do the uh, force upgrade here. So, and here we can see that it tries to make some kind of installation. Okay. So probably it's my, my ah, no, it's a fresh one. So it creates two uh, write instances, two read instances, one gateway, and one mini IO. Uh, the main thing that it will also run the um, some specific jobs to create the um, bunch of the buckets inside of the like your S3 or my mini IO and to initialize everything. So we need to wait for a while. Okay, now it's installing the Fluent Beat and it installed the Grafana. So, and I see that like it's installed Grafana, it installed Loki, and it installed the Fluent Beat. So, let me check what we have here. Yeah, we have Grafana, we have the Fluent Beat, and we had uh, the Loki itself. Let's take a look, just for case, let's take a look on the um, uh, logs from the Fluent Beat, and we can see that Fluent Beat <clears throat> automatically discovered the files related to the um, specific containers and started to harvest the data from it and started to send the data to the Loki. Yeah, in our case. And we have the Grafana here. Uh, like, to make everything clear, what I actually did, I created some kind of shortcut. So I will just forward the port from my Grafana to my local machine to don't create the ingress. Uh, make connect. Okay, everything is pretty. So the default will be email. <clears throat> and as I don't remember the real password, I'll just take a look at inside of the secrets. Okay. Again. So the first thing that I just want to take a look is my data sources. So it's like Loki. Let's test that everything works fine. Yeah, the data is connected. I had some problem before, like during the preparation of this demo, I had a problem that I just missed this custom header. And I had a problem that like this provider wasn't work fine. So just keep this in mind that this option is pretty important when you use the multi-tenancy mode. Like, and to get the data from the like, logs data from the Loki, what I just need to do. So it's already indexed some portion of the labels that 
were automatically um, indexed for me. So for example, I'll select the cluster and the value for that cluster will be mini Q. And I also want to add some JSON parsing. Yeah. Uh, Okie dokie. Let me select last example 15 minutes. Okay, here is it. So um, the mostly if you had chance to use the Elasticsearch, the UI is pretty similar. Yeah, you have a timeline with a list of the like specific logs and you have a set of the logs. And also you can like, um, like what you can do, you can um, take this, um, a log line and expand it and uh, like go across the go across the line. So here the original log line. Yeah. And for example, if I want to um, take the information about the about the container name, so I can make the ad hoc stuff, and I see like the most common occurrences of the of the logs like during the last fifteen minutes. Uh, it's like an example. Also, I can just add the filter out for for this value. Yeah, if I just want to look up for this specific value. So it demonstrates how important uh, to have the um, structured logs. Yeah. So we added a lot of the metadata to the logs with the Kubernetes filter plugin for the Fluent Bit. Yeah, just added some portion of the parsing, and now we have a pretty logs. And we will be able to like na easily navigate across that logs. And also we will be able to create the dashboards and alerts across that logs. Yeah, so for example, here we have a plain text, some part of the plain text logs. So as I mentioned, here we have a plain text log. And based on this log line, we like cannot do any kind of um, dashboards and etc. So it's the reason why we need the processor that will parse this line. For example, it will get the response code, it will get the request method, it will get the path, it will get the protocol, um, like it will get the timestamp from the log line uh, and etc. And then it will be uh, like defined as the, um, defined as a separate field and we will be able to navigate across that fields. Uh, and the cool feature for this one that we have the logs live so we can uh, like in the real time we are able to see how the logs come to our logic. Yeah. Uh, the main problem is that I had a chance to uh, set up the monitoring of this Loki because it requires some separate uh, Prometheus stuff. But um, like as uh, uh, some portion of the testing that you will perform after this session, try to configure the separate Prometheus release and um, take a look. Uh, which resources cons consumes the Loki and which metrics you can get for the monitoring of the Loki. And the same like from the um, Fluent Beat side. Okay, from the demonstration side, I think that all. So what I actually can do here, I just can do the cleanup, but I won't spend your time for that. Uh, any questions about the practical part? Do you share this uh, hand file somewhere? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So after this call, we will uh, share the blog post. So there you will find the presentation, there you will find uh, the test suite. So I always share the test suites. And also there you will find the link to the video. So you will be able to reproduce all that, all that items by yourself. Okay. Hey Elder, what did you use to show Helm differences? Uh, so this Helm file, it's um, th this Helm file tool. Yeah, it operates with um, uh, Helm diff plugin. Oh, so, Helm diff. Okay, okay. Yeah, I and, thought that there is something different, but okay. 
no, 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 it's Helm diff. So uh, one more great thing of this Helm file that uh, it will install all necessary plugins automatically to your Helm. So, and every time when you do Helm, uh, Helm file apply, it will run the diff, check if there is any kind of difference. And if yes, then it will like do the upgrade. If not, it will just uh, like do nothing. Any other questions? Okay, gotcha. Uh, so if you don't have any other questions, then that's all from my side. It was like uh, my my longest performance <laughs> on, the, on the community. It's almost two hours, but I hope it's uh, it's useful for you. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Eldar, for your speech, for your input uh, in our DevOps community. It was interesting and informative uh, as uh, usual. And uh, thanks all for join and stay <laughs> with us a long time. And um, uh, we will receive a feedback form uh, shortly. Please uh, complete it. Uh, your opinion matters. And we will be happy to see all of you next time. Uh, have a nice day. Be safe. Uh, bye. Thank you.